Imagine unlocking a door and beyond that door is another dimension, another dimension of sound. And this strange fluty form of music that has a distinctive English feel, replete with puns and self-deprecating humour, all wrapped up in this jazz-inflected melodic bop. We are, of course, talking about the Canterbury scene, a term that Pi Hastings insists probably was uh, coined by the media in the same way as uh, Mersey Beat or Kraut Rock, for example. But caravans certainly brought their own sound to the mix, this psychedelic and pastoral blend, uh, certainly on the first couple of albums anyway. The real essence of the Canterbury sound is this tension between the complicated harmonies and uh, extended improvisations. In fact, one commentator said that uh, in the very best Canterbury sound, the musically silly and the musically serious are juxtaposed in an amusing and endearing way. Many have complained about the term itself, including uh, Dave Stewart, who takes issue with the nomenclature, arguing that many of the artists like himself, who are actually labelled as Canterbury, have nothing to do with the place whatsoever. However, I'd say it's more closely defined by that whimsical and sardonic jazz blend. More about sound than geography. One of the most interesting factors of the Canterbury sound is that blend of voices, that very understated English mewing, especially when it's juxtaposed with the, the soulful and transatlantic yop of many of their contemporaries. It was an intriguing meld of voices. You get the rich baritone of Kevin Ayres, the jousting with the ethereal warblings of Robert White. Likewise, uh, in Caravan, you, you had the blend of Pi Hastings and Dave Sinclair's voice. These vocal dynamics are one of the components of the Canterbury sound um, and these dynamics of course would also inform the, the works of Hatfield and the North. This is a, a real mishmash, an eclectic fusion of sound from the almost pop rock of um, very early Soft Machine and Caravan to the avant-garde composed pieces and improvised jazz. Interestingly, Gong's uh, saxophonist has uh, defined the scene as having certain chord changes, in particular the use of minor second chords, certain harmonic combinations, and a greater clarity in aesthetics and a way of improvising that is very different from what is usually done in jazz. But these fronds of sound reach way beyond Canterbury, of course. In fact, it's argued that uh, these Canterbury bands had much bigger success in Europe, continental Europe, than they did in the UK. And when they played in Europe, they often played to much bigger audiences. And as a result, they influenced uh, a lot of bands on the continent, bands like uh, uh, Moving Gelatine Plates and of course Super Sister, which uh, hail from the Netherlands, I believe. And even later on, the USA began to embrace that Canterbury sound with bands like The Muffins, Glass, and uh, Happy the Man, to name but a few. Even David Allen took his own lunar exploration over to the States in the in the guise of New York Gong. In fact, David Allen said future generations would define the Canterbury scene as thinky music in black shiny shoes. The Wildflowers is where we should start. They were the brainchild of Brian and Hugh Hopper. Brian Hopper said that the uh, band initially cut its teeth playing experimental jazz. Pie Hastings seems to contradict that, saying that the Wildflowers seemed to start off actually playing uh, R&B standards. Nevertheless, one of the pivotal moments in this band's history was David Allen turning up and wanting to, looking for a room in Robert White's parents' house, bringing with him a collection of LPs that included Charlie Mingus and Thelonious Monk. In terms of the prog firmament, it's a bit like Jagger and Richard's fortuitous meeting on Dartford Station. But this band progressed and began to explore more intriguing avenues of sound before ultimately fragmenting and deciding they needed to all to go on different kinds of journeys. But in the words of that great philosopher Winnie the Pooh, I always get to where I'm going by walking away from where I've been. And this band fragmented and those shards became the experimental splodge that we now know as the Canterbury scene. The genealogy of all these bands seemed to be traced back to one singular tree. Caravan, Gong, the Soft Machine. Interestingly, the Soft Machine took their name from the title of a William S. Burroughs novel. The Soft Machine would become a three-piece due to the fact that David Allen had uh, some immigration issues, shall we say. He, of course, was stranded in France. But this three-piece band were incredibly experimental and managed by Chaz Chandler. In fact, it was a fortuitous conversation with Jimi Hendrix that saw a major development in the Soft Machine's sound. 
It was Hendrix that suggested they should plug in their Hammond organ into a fuzz box. This gave them a harder, more abrasive edge. And certainly Jimi Hendrix with his own brand of psychedelic blues knew all about power, performance and abrasive edges. But this gave the soft machine a dirtier and darker sound. Uh, not so ethereal and twee, I suppose. Gong were formed by David Allen in Paris and very much defined by an eclectic mix of trips around the astral plane and uh, space whispers, as they call it. It was a perfect blend of freeform jazz, metaphysics and acid. Camembert Electric, uh, how very French, was their second LP. But it's an LP that I feel very much defines them. And the Soft Machine recorded their second album in the USA where they are supporting the Jimi Hendrix experience. The album was a blend of trippy instrumentation, psychedelic and jazzy influences, all topped off with Robert White's beautiful pining and androgynous voice. Andy Summers, interestingly, would uh, join them about this time, but the band ultimately exhausted themselves and split up. Nevertheless, when the rest of the band came back to the UK, Robert White stayed there and actually recorded some interesting demos with Jimi Hendrix on bass that they would be worth hearing. But he was also introduced to the sound of Frank Zappa and the Mothers and the Velvet Underground, which would become hugely influential. Robert White did eventually return to the UK and record another album, The Soft Machine, as they were contractually obliged to do so but by this time Kevin Ayres had already jumped ship and he was replaced by Hugh Hopper. Of course Kevin Ayres went on to do some wonderful wonderful solo work in fact there's an excellent review if I may say so myself of his album Joy of a Toy on my Patreon. Mark Wilberg said great folk and hymns are a perfect blend the perfect marriage of text and tune and this music was a huge influence on Dave Sinclair who brings that ornate sense of Englishness to the music of Caravan. There's no doubt that the influence of the church greatly affected his musical compass. Caravan, of course, a wonderful blend of folk, psychedelia, patched corduroys and naughty puns. If I could do it again, I'd do it all over you, is one of theirs, I believe. There is a distinct sense of humour which very much defines the Canterbury scene, and that is the art of punning. And certainly drawing on the anarchic influences of uh, the goons and Monty Python. But there's something specifically British about it. A very seaside postcard type aesthetic. Certainly in the saucy punning of Pi Hastings. Almost as if Caravan become this symbiosis. This perfect melding of Pentangle and Up Pompeii. But this band became defined by Dave Sinclair's throbbing organ. Q. Sir James Laugh. Uh, but they also had a support slot with Deep Purple, which I think was in 1969, I could be wrong there, but it was about that time. And this certainly couldn't have harmed the band at all. This band were a pleasant blend of psychedelic pop and improvisational pieces, certainly on the first two albums. On the first two albums, Pi Hastings writes about 80% of the material. This changes, of course, with their third album in the land of the grey and pink, where the majority of the material is written by Dave and Richard Sinclair. Dirk Mont Campbell was uh, another interesting figure in the whole Canterbury scene, grew up in Nairobi and there's no doubt that the musical textures there uh, certainly influenced him. He went on to form Egg, of course, and National Health. Before then he was in the band Uriel, although they were told that they should change their name because they sounded uh, a little bit too much like urinal, taking the piss perhaps. Eventually the band Egg formed. I don't think Uriel recorded anything. Nevertheless, in 1969, they signed to the Derham label, but of course would eventually change their name. They did actually record one album for Decca, but they, they recorded it under the band's name uh, Arkazal, uh, which is, I don't know, I almost see it like as, a, as an unofficial Egg album in some respects. And Egg, like a lot of these bands, used to like to play around with these verbal gymnastics, relying on puns. Now, for example, Polite Force and Civil Surface, for example. But without all those naughty trouser fumblings of Caravan. Carry on Canterbury, so to speak. Anyway, Egg split, or should I say scrambled, in 1972. Elton Dean joins the Soft Machine in 1969 and moves them to a heavier jazz sound. Uh, it saw, also saw the band uh, signed to CBS Records. They're actually on the same label as Miles Davis. But at this time, it's, it's when Robert White and the Soft Machine start experimenting with the Echoplex machine that yields some interesting lysergic textures. Robert White was certainly enamoured with the sonic possibilities offered up by such equipment. However, the Soft Machine at this time were increasingly moving towards uh, purely instrumental work. 
which left Robert White feeling somewhat disgruntled. In fact, his solo album, End of an Ear, he states in the notes, made by unemployed singer, currently playing drums with this soft machine. Well, the writing was uh, very prominently on that specific wall, and of course he leaves the soft machine in 1971 and forms a Matching Mole with Dave Sinclair. Matching Mole, the band's name itself, was a pun, as the translation, the French translation of the uh, title of the William S. Burroughs novel, The Soft Machine, is actually La Matching Mole. My word, what wags these Canterbury lot are. The band also featured Bill McCormick, who had played with Quiet Sun. Uh, Quiet Sun was a band that showcased the guitar talents of Phil Manzanera. Uh, Phil Manzanera, of course, would leave to uh, achieve huge success with loads of eyeliner and sparkle in Roxy Music, effectively replacing uh, Davy O'List. However, Quiet Sun focused on acid-tinged arrangements of things like uh, Crossroads and Rolling and Tumbling with Manzanera. Uh, exploring the possibilities of, of heavily fuzz-toned guitar. In fact, one commentator said it was like uh, the home county's very own Randy, California. It was about this time that Robert White had his uh, tragic and life-defining accident. He fell out of a window and broke his back. He would go on to record a solo album called Rock Bottom, quite aptly titled. And David Allen was still very busy with Gong, flying around the astral plane in teapots or experimenting with strange costumes, ideas that they got from Peter Gabriel, it seems. And it was about this time, 73, 74, that Gone produced that wonderful trilogy of albums, uh, uh, Flying Teapot, Angel's Egg, and You. You, interestingly, was recorded at uh, Manor Studio in London. Caravan also had some interesting additions to their sound, bringing in the viola as a prominent instrument, which features on their wonderful, wonderful album, uh, For Girls Who Grow Plump in the Night which in my opinion has a, a more accessible sound and actually saw them supporting Procol Harum and Fleetwood Mac in the USA. Do you remember Delivery? I think I mentioned them, but they split, of course, and from the ashes of that band rose Hatfield and the North. But they moved away from that blues idiom to records based on odd time signatures and uh, uh, strange riffs and protracted melodies, all associated with that Canterbury style. Now, this band also featured Dave Stewart and Dave Sinclair. It's kind of like a Canterbury supergroup. The first album by Hatfield and the North was on the Virgin label and actually had Robert Wyatt guesting on it. Gong actually toured with Hatfield and the North. I mean, my word, what a show that must have been. National Health were formed in 1975 by Dave Stewart and Alan Gowan. A uh, largely instrumental band, it has to be said. And Gong produced their first album after David Allen leaves. I think the album is Shamal and it's produced by Nick Mason. What a strange journey this is from the early blossoming of the wildflowers to this trajectory into the 1970s and beyond. In fact, the influence of the Canterbury sound is, is quite prominent in you know bands like um, Sid Arthur, Antique Seeking Nuns, Amoeba Split. And you get a band like the Divine Comedy that owes as much to the Canterbury sound as they do to that vaudevillian pastiche they're famed for. Anyway, I hope you found this video interesting. If you haven't switched off and you're still watching, I'd like to thank you very much for doing just that. Do be sure to click like, subscribe and do all that stuff. Check some of the cards and other video links that are now popping up here. Anyway, I hope you're well and staying safe. More importantly than that, of course, is that you keep listening.